Morning, guys. Um, just want to talk about five questions for Tommy Robinson because obviously been struggling to get hold of him. Um, it's been interesting seeing some of the questions. Sorry, some of the responses. That's, they're not questions. Um, where people are in, instantly must be racist. He must be this. Must be that. I'll tell you what. As I said myself, it's more a question of asking the questions rather than jumping to conclusions. I've got to admit, if you use a Corbyn image on my uh, channel, you'll instantly get deleted because <laughs> I hate Corbyn. Um, he has nothing to offer the United Kingdom. And I it's not that I detest him personally. Is I sit and look at him and Diane Abbott and I think how much those are, people are costing the taxpayers. Um, and it does roll me up. I mean, Diane Abbott taking money from the BBC for the tripe she comes out with when she struggles to put a sentence together is insulting to the taxpayers that have given her money to talk. Why she was on TV? Get rid of the woman. Anyway, back to Tommy Robinson. I've put together five questions, and I'll put my answers to that as well, because then you can get my view on this. So it's a bit... Rather than me just reading out five questions, it makes it a bit more interesting, but also it'd be interesting to see Tommy Robinson if he ever responds. First one is, is it religion or hate? Because a lot of the stuff that gets mentioned is relating to the Muslims. And I need to understand his viewpoints on this, because I have a very open view to religion, in the sense, I don't like religion, I have no interest in religion, but I have no inch issue with other people studying it, believing in it, doing what they like with it, as long as it doesn't harm others. That's my view on religion. Very easy. Um, but the question is, is it religion that's a problem? Or is it certain groups? Is it extremism? Is it the way things are skewed? Now, here's my version. My answer to this is based on the things I've experienced over the years. I have worked in Solid Hall, I've worked in Walsall, I've worked in Birmingham, and there are very large communities from different groups in there which get away with murder. Um, I can't even, I was gonna say not literally, but I won't even confirm that now. Um, but the, the point being is, I'll give you an example with Somalians in Bloomsbury. Um, a friend of mine has a butcher shop there. So I'm not even sure if it's still there now. A lot of the Somalis moved into the tower blocks and they progressively have been trying to push the businesses out. They do a lot of illegal trading. Um, they, they got this um, community center that was free, no taxes, pretty much run for free as a community service. In there, they trade everything, from meat to pretty much whatever you like. Um, it's been like that for a long time. They don't pay business rates, they don't pay nothing. Um, and there is the, these grants that are given for different, to open new businesses there. And they'll move in and open the shop, tax-free and whatever, for the first year. Then they will close it down, and then their brother will open a shop, tax-free, for the next year. Um, and that's been going on for some time. A friend of mine, like I said, has had a butcher shop for about 25, 30 years there. They were complaining that he was selling halal meat because halal meat is not religious. It's, it's the preparation of the meat. And they were spraying things like aerosols through his vents. They were sending people from the um, environmental health to assess his stuff because they were complaining there was stuff in the meat, this, that, and the other. And as he said to them, he said, you come in here, you come in here to try and shut me down. Somebody who's been here for over 30 years, well, over 25 years. Um, and I paid my taxes. I don't get any discount. Been here for a long time. I serve the community. And I'm getting complained by the community center over there that is illegally selling meat in carrier bags yet you won't even go in there. So why are you here? And they couldn't really respond to that, but basically tell them where to go. Um, point being, that's an example of a community being formed to suit its own needs and service itself by pushing out the locals. And that's what it was doing.
is because the businesses start moving out because nobody wants to go there anymore. Um, and that gets back to one of the things that is a fundamental problem with different communities. That's not a Muslim thing. It's not a hate thing, but it's a politically correct thing. Um, they allow communities to form within their own little hubs. This is why you end up with different areas that are not only predominantly, but pretty much all from the same background, same culture, religion, etc. Um, I also experienced that a lot of the racism that gets touted is not related to whites whatsoever. There was often um, fighting between Pakistanis and Jamaican backgrounds. Um, it was not white attacking these guys, white attacking. It was, there weren't any whites involved. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because I don't think anybody does. I don't think anybody mentions it. And I know when I speak to people about it, it says, yeah, but you know, we know that goes on. And that's it. It's like, but they, this is the thing. Racism is pushed as a white problem. It's not, it's not because quite simply it covers all. Um, and I do recognize that the, if you recognize racism going two ways, guess what that is? That's equality. That is real equality. Recognizing that people trying to force businesses to shut down so they can take over the entire area and pay no tax is a problem. It's almost like being a mafia there. And that would get on my side of saying that is hate crime because they are attacking the local community, which are, well, were predominantly white and changed it to Somalian. Um, but nobody will talk about that. I'll tell you that now. Nobody will talk about that. Um, what else can I say on that? Yeah, the religion, the separation between, is it groups within this or is it as a whole? Um, because one of the things I do recognize is passes, people being passive. Um, I do understand that that's one of the frustrations a lot of people that are non-Muslim complain about is the fact they do not see enough people from the Muslim com communities complaining about some of the stuff that goes on with the other groups. Oh, sorry, other people within their own communities. I recognize that as well. Whites do that. Whites do that all the time. People go in downtown on a Friday night drunk and fighting. Um, is a problem in the United Kingdom, and we don't do enough about it. Um, Worcester, for example, it has become a bit of a cesspit of university students. There is nothing being done by the police to combat the problems there. In fact, if anything, they try and shut you up for complaining. My parents had this problem for years because they'd lived in a nice cul-de-sac in a 80s built house family oriented environment. There's probably only four of those houses that aren't owned by the university now or other rented accommodation for students. They've turned the place into a complete hellhole for people that actually live in the area. So I do understand that it's not all from one side. And I do understand that the recognition of the problems is a big problem. And I do understand that the suppression by the media, police and others is a major problem. So the question on that one is, how do you fix it? First thing I would say on that is pure transparency. Everything out in the open. And I've got to admit, although I know a few ain't into the blockchain, having a completely decentralized media network where you can put whatever you like on there will swing both ways, but ultimately you will get transparency throughout whether somebody hates something or likes something, the transparency is there. And that's the bit that I think we need because otherwise we get false media, which is what we're getting fed. That's why when Tommy, Tommy's pushed, it's always as far right, extremism, blah, blah, blah. And none of the other bits are mentioned. You've got to find the bit in the middle where you start seeing all the facts coming together. So you can see what's driving this and driving this and what fixes it. Um, and that's, like I said, I want to chat to Tommy about these things quite simply to get his true view on this. Um, but that's my first question. Next one is immigration. 
or we're touching on some hotbeds today. Immigration, um, how to deal with it, and what's the problems? Now, the first thing I want to say is Tony Blair is the problem in this. The open border for the EU started it. On top of that, allowing Calais to form where with the jungle or whatever was a second layer of a problem because you've got EU and non-EU. And as somebody who sits in Spain, I recognize the freedom of movement having value, but at the same time, I don't take from a community, I actually bring money to it. So that's one of the things I recognize is the ability to actually produce or work, etc. Um, so I do agree with some immigration. What I don't agree with is people that have no interest in working or people that move there because they, socially they can sponge off the system. That shouldn't be allowed. The way I would deal with this, my this is how I would deal with it, like for like, a true like for like. So if I'm here in Spain, I should be entitled to the same service I would get in the United Kingdom if I was unemployed, sick or whatever. I know some people go, ah, but I'm not unemployed anyway. Um, but at the same time, if I was French going to the UK, that same social system that come from France should be the one that I work with until I'm integrated. So nobody should have to give you a house, accommodation, food, weekly income, etc., because you should never have gone there if you couldn't look after yourself. The whole point of the benefit and unemployment systems was to deal with people in need. Um, need is a little bit different from want. Um, and that's why I would quite simply put these things to make it very difficult to receive anything until you'd integrated. I come to Spain, they didn't pay my rent. They didn't give me unemployment benefit. Give me a lot of paperwork to fill in, but beyond that, nothing, absolutely nothing. And that's why people do not stay in these countries and head to the UK, head to Germany, but there is no obligation of looking after these people. Secondly, I do believe in skills. The UK does not need an extra load of people that quite simply have zero skills. Um, I do recognize we've got Polish doctors, dentists, uh, Spanish nurses, etc. And I'll tell you what, the UK needs them and shouldn't push those people out. They should encourage them to come to the UK and settle because the UK has a lot of unskilled people. Um, but I wouldn't want a lot of unskilled labor which is what we often get. And I'm just talking from within the EU. I'm not talking about non-EUs yet. So I would actually say freedom of movement, I agree with. The ability to move to another country is fine. If you're unskilled to move to another country, that is fine. But in all cases, the state shouldn't support you. Now, if you had paid social security and stuff like, say I've been in Spain, and my social school has been paid for the last 25 years working here and everything else, then that's a different transition because I'm a taxpayer. And that's part of real freedom of movement in the sense that I do pay my way and I will go to the UK and I will work, etc. cetera. Um, in that, that case, you've got to recognize the fact of this has already been paid and that's a similar standard of living. That is fine because they are paid their weight. That's part of the EU thing. Um, but like I said, dead weight, don't need, don't want it. Um, now non-EUs, 99% of them probably have no right to be there anyway. Um, now you're probably thinking I'm pretty harsh on that. If you look at how many of them are actually coming from places that are not war zones, are not um, living in fear, they're purely moving from wanting, from living in a shack or whatever, to wanting a better life. That is not, that is not um, part of an asylum seeking or anything else. That is migration. 
and there is no right for them to be in Europe at all. Um, wanting and right are very different and quite simply I know some of these areas in Spain would benefit from an injection of communities because they're dying. You know, at the end of the day, you head further in, land up in mountain zones, etc. The population is dying. They actually want some migration. But at the same time, people just arriving when they feel like it should stop. There's no right to be here. Now, refugees is another thing. Refugees, you've got to recognize certain things that get ignored by the media. First thing is safety. If you move to another country of safety, then you have no right of passage. So when you get to Jordan, Turkey or whatever, that's where it stops. There is no right of passage into Europe. That you have met the obligation of being in safety. And sorry, whether you want a council house or just want to start a new life, it's not the West's obligation. It's not Europe's obligation. And I'll move to my next part now. I'm sure I'm going to get flagged for saying that. Um, recognition of foreign policy, which is a, another question. Yeah, that's another question. So I'll move on to foreign policy. So we've, we've covered people that shouldn't be here, um, but I'll move on to foreign policy now, which is why this all fits together with the immigration. The UK and the whole of Europe are involved in things all over the place on a regular basis. And whether we know it or not, they are. Be it in Africa, be it in Syria, be it in Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, whatever. The Syrian obligation, I think, is actually tied between the pipeline between Iran, Iraq, and Syria to Europe. This is why Russia is fighting it so hard, because quite simply, they do not want that pipeline. We get our gas from Russia currently. Um, so the point is, Iran wants to sell oil, wants to sell gas, and currently it needs that pipeline. And Europe needs that pipeline to put it in a better position to fight with Russia on its pricing. It's a contractual obligation. This is the thing. When you're all thinking humanitarian, bear in mind your government, eh? they're thinking profit. They're thinking long term. They're thinking, don't care. And yet they'll go on TV with a weeping heart and all this stuff at the same time going around involved in starting conflicts around the globe, providing arms to all sides and quite simply sitting there with a paper, with a wet pen, waiting for somebody to win an outright whatever, wherever to sign a contract. Um, and I do recommend looking into Afghanistan and how that was set up as well, because it's another pipeline. Um, so my view on that is very, very simple. Immigration. There has to be a recognition of how that is connected. You know, foreign policy and immigration go hand in hand. You've got to, you can't blame people for wanting a new life when we sit there and destroy their countries. There has to be a recognition that, should we be doing this? Is it just for profit? Who benefits? Why do they benefit? And is it worth doing? You know, at the end of the day, if there is no positive outcome in this, beyond financial greed, then should we even be there? Because a lot of people still think UK wave, waving the flag um, is how the world works these days. Globalization has changed all that. The corporations, corporations are borderless. They just move head office. They're everywhere. They have no allegiance to any flag or any country. They're allegiance to themselves. And that's one of the things that people don't seem to spend enough time looking at is the recognition that so many things are not as they used to be sold to us on. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that on that one. And then the next one is extremism. How do you tackle extremism? Because I do think fundamentally there are a lot of problems within certain communities in the UK because of a lack of integration. 
I do think that things need to be forced for integration and dismantling of large communities that are formed and basically try to live outside the laws and rules and country that governs them. And whether they like it or not, they are governed. If you're a British citizen, you are governed by the United Kingdom. Um, so whether they like it or not, they have to integrate. And my view on that is that's how you do it. Forced integration. I'm not on about people get barcoded and whatever. I'm talking about the fact that people need to separate and integrate, not form large communities that have no interest in integrating and often go against everything on purpose because it encourages these developments of people at the next age group to do exactly the same as they were. And you'll, I mean, you see it sometimes from Jamaican descendants as well, where there's a chip on the shoulder from stuff that went on in the 50s and 60s. Now, I'll let you in a little secret. I wasn't even born. So the stuff that went on in the 50s and 60s relating to the racism and cards in the window that you know, wouldn't let people live there, I get it, because I don't agree with it. But actually trying to blame people like myself for those sort of things, it's just as stupid. Because quite simply, we weren't even there. We weren't born. And on, on top of that, today's society is not built that way. And we wouldn't agree with that, and it wouldn't be allowed. So saying my grandparents had this or whatever, move on, move on. I'm, I'm Irish Scottish. We've had land clearances. We've had um, people from Ireland sent to the, the Jamaica and other islands because they were cheaper. They were cheaper than slaves. So don't tell me about hardships. Everybody's at it. Um, but one of the things I do want to stress on this is people need to move to today. Stop living in the past because we need to start dealing with these issues. Because, like I said, corporations, they do this. They're playing all sides. And while you're, we're all sitting and arguing with each other, they're profiteering at all. So I would say dealing with extremism is a starts with integration. Because then people don't even think about it because they're integrated. It starts moving away from, oh, my brother and whatever, to, ah, oh, yeah, it's sad what's going on there now. Which is the way most people in the UK think about things. They don't really do anything about anything. Um, but that would be the way to actually reduce the extremism and make it more connected to different communities and start forming a community instead of pockets of them. Um, yeah, we covered overseas policy. I know we're on the EU. Another one. What should happen with the EU? Uh, first thing is, I'm going to stop a second to have a cup of tea. Okay, what should we do about the EU? And that goes out to Tommy Robinson. Now my version. The EU fundamentally has some good points. And then it has many bad. And I would say when people talk about the UK, the Brexit and all those bits and pieces. I recognise the fact that our failing has been our representatives in the EU. That is part of it. Now being where it is today or when all the agreements happened where people had too much control in Europe, it comes down to weak governance. Um, because if they'd fought in our corner instead of lining their pockets, um, the UK would have been a much better position than it is now. Now, I was listening to about Italy yesterday, which was an interesting one related to the EU, um, because they're not allowed to form a government against the EU. You're not allowed to be anti-EU. Now, I found that very, very wrong because the EU is not their country. It's not their state. It's nothing to do with them. They're part of the EU, but it's tied in with this um, financial bailout that they've had. But I think it should be illegal because a lot of Italy's problems have come from the EU. And also they're very bad at managing money and always have been. Um, but... If you cannot form a government against the EU in the sense that having your own voice and directing it in a way to correct the problems with your economy, then you're in a bad place because there's a serious problem here. 
the people are becoming anti-EU. So you're trying to enforce a government that doesn't agree with its people. I'm, I'm trying to keep out the Middle East, but it, that's <laughs> that's what happens. You get an uprising. Um, the point being here, that is not what the EU should be dealing with. The EU should never have existed. It should have been the common market, which was what was signed off in 1970, was it 75, 73? It was in the 70s, early 70s, because I, I was actually in the Out Hebrides at the time. I was very young at the time, but we were the only place that voted against the common market, the Out Hebrides. Um, but the point being is, you've got a serious problem here. It's not been about free trade. It's been about corporate spreading it across the entire EU for their own benefit, which goes back to us, my point previously. I can buy wine here for 50 cents, and when it hits the UK, it's four pounds a bottle, because the tax is three pounds 50, I think. There's something to think about, because it's a free market. How did that happen? <laughs> I mean, that's that's a common market. Why why are we paying tax on something that is going to the UK from within the EU? And then you start looking at the way money's being dispersed, and that, that's the polite way of putting it, um, relating to subsidies and how. Uh, how pension funds and things are set up and tax avoidance and everything else by EU MPs, etc. And it's become a parasitical burden for all of Europe. Um, but I believe in the common market. I don't believe in the, the EU in its current form. I don't think it should be allowed to form in that way. I believe in things like freedom of movement, like I said, but it shouldn't be in this in a way that's funded by a by a country without integration. Integration in the form of paying taxes and everything else. Um, it's not freedom of movement to move just to move from Romania to the UK just to go. Can I have a house for for me and my family and we'll sit here because this is great because we get it all for free. Recognition should be that you didn't get anything where you come from. You don't get nothing here. And, and I'm I'm all for that. Spain doesn't give me nothing. I don't know, I'm not complaining. I don't think I have a right of entitlement here. It's not my country. I respect their laws. And that's the thing, I respect their laws. They, they, this is where things go going wrong because the UK accommodates for anybody and it needs to wake up. It's not being racist, it's not being um, rude. It's being realistic. If their own country were not giving them this stuff, why the hell are we? But anyway, so I do think the common market is important. I do think movement around the EU is important. Freedom of trade between borders is important. Um, but it involves getting rid of a lot of the lies that we're told that, for example, it's free, free movement. It's not free movement. I'll just give you an example with the wine. How can how can it go from 50 pence to £3.50 tax added to it? There should be no tax added. Should be the 20% tax on the 50 pence that's here. Not take to the UK, it's now worth four or five quid. No, that's not how this works. Um, so a lot of things like that have been rip off in the sense that a lot of UK and Europe have seen price rises because things didn't do this. You know, UK pricing here, they didn't go this, they went this. Um, so you got to bear that in mind. And I think part of that would be the UK actually getting some strength. It needs a political leader with a party that constantly doesn't stab it in the back, which is what you've got with the Conservatives. It also needs a leader that's competent, so that rules Corbyn out. Um, but I do think the UK should do some fundamental things 
and I'll just go through what I think it needs to do. Skill assessments, evaluations, and re-educating people. I'm not on about barcoding people and you're no good, bullet to the back of the head. I'm talking about realizing there is a systematic problem in the education system. But we still have a lot of people up to 35 that may have had little or no opportunities to learn or recognition where their problems are. Because it may be that some people are, I don't know, they're illiterate. So they couldn't go past a certain point because nobody's enforced that. Because I know um, years ago, my brothers, the school said that the kids, my brothers should be learning at home how to read and write and not at the school. Now, I'm not being, maybe I'm picking at straws here, but shouldn't the school actually be teaching them something? Because they, as my dad pointed out, they know about Romans and Vikings, but you haven't been even teaching them how to read and write. Now, they can read and write, but not to the same level as myself. But the point being is, that was a fundamental failure. And I'm getting back to the 60s again, because the education system went down the toilet then. Um, being a well-rounded person was more important than actually being able to be a competent person. Um, functioning on, stressing on math, sciences, and other core educational things is far more important than there was a course in the I just remember reading about it in Birmingham then I've seen it on the TV about LGBT studies for schools and I was just thinking when I seen it I just thought I've got no problems with those communities whatsoever but I just don't want to know and my kids shouldn't have to know about it because I want them to learn maths I want them to learn English, I want them to read, write, and everything else. Cramming all this stuff into an education system is just wrong. You've got to get the fundamentals right. Once you get the fundamentals right, you can add things to it. But if you this starts here, you've got to have your language, you've got to have your reading and writing, you've got the admin of mathematics, you've got to have something as your starting point and the structuring of an education system that encourages people to learn. I don't think they have that in the United Kingdom. And haven't for a long time. Back to the 60s. Um, so the first thing is you need to address that there is a major skill shortage all over the place. And then address the problem relating to the fact that we're not educating people properly. This gets me on to immigration because it overlaps with immigration. Because if you have more skilled people coming out, then the reliance on immigrants reduces as well. There would be more British nurses, there would be more British doctors, mathematicians, um, people in the science areas. In fact, South Korea, Cuba, they recognized doctors and sent them abroad. And if you look at how South Korea and Cuba used that to their advantage, I recommend doing so. The UK is an island. Well, it's, you count Jersey, Hebrides, Shetlands, or whatever. It's more than one island. Um, but the point being is, it's got to recognize this on its own. And recognize on your own is actually starting to build your own infrastructure, building towards your own future, not being dictated to, which is where the EU has gone. And I do not believe the UK should be dictated to, or any other European country should be dictated to. The representation should be a bit like the UN on a voting system um, for EU matters. Local matters are local problems. Um, so where was I? Yeah, education system. Yeah, infrastructure. The UK has the ability to stop doing things wrong and starting to get rid of some of its parasites. There's a lot of political parasites in the UK. There's a lot of nepotism in the UK. It needs to be recognized, highlighted and removed. The UK could have been producing its own trains, but it sent the contracts elsewhere. And I do recommend having a look at that 
because they were quite happy promoting it in Coventry, then a week after dumping the contract to somebody else. Um, and I would actually say the people behind it, start investigating where the money goes. If you start seeing people getting paid off left, right and centre, don't give them a, oh, I'm ever so sorry, I didn't realise I was corrupt and a thief. Um, I'll give the money back. Send them to jail for 10 years. Job done. Um, solar energy. Renewable energies. Uh, the power plants we're dealing with right now deals with all the waste management. If you can produce electricity cheap enough, you're in a very competitive position globally um, because your manufacturing costs reduce. I would actually get rid of minimum wage as well. I don't believe in minimum wage. I do believe in a minimum minimum wage, but not the minimum wage as it's set right now because it's actually designed for inflation. Inflation devalues everything. It's designed to bury some of that debt that the government owes and it's designed to devalue house valuations so that people can invest more money in it. It has very, very little benefit to people. Um, so bear that in mind, because it just pushes the costs up. It causes inflation. It's not beneficial at all. You're better off with having a structure which looks to revalue housing and understanding what a standard of living is in the sense that you need to recognize that some things are needed and some things are wanted. Some things should be encouraged and some things removed. Uh, for example, a lot of the sports centers and stuff, the facilities should be accessible to everybody. And I would say the NHS should actually be more involved in things like that, like having fat counts even and trying to change people's diets. Because in all honesty, I would say a lot of people don't even know how to eat healthy. A lot of people don't even know it's do more than open a tin of beans. That needs to change. And that gets back to the education and actually having an education that has value and actually has functionality and competence. Um, so encouraging people to actually function as a community is also another thing. Um, community integration is a major thing to actually make put the Brit the great back in Britain. Um, those are the sort of things I would focus on, drawing people together rather than allow them to form their own groups and separate. I would also recommend, like I was saying, um, access to swimming pools, education, in, uh, investment in fitness, in edu investment in Things like cycling over cars, especially in inner cities, but also understanding you've still got to put the bike somewhere. So having some sort of system that recognizes that you may need bikes on trains, do something about it. Because um, I know myself, I've been on trains and you can only get about five, five bikes on a train because they take up so much room because they're not designed for it. Um, so having some support in there, as well as maybe ticket price reduction for people with bikes, um, to encourage more people to cycle would be useful. In the same way, I'd let the little scooters and things go, you know, as long as they're not electric powered. But, you know, the ones where people are, I mean, I see them, see them in uh, some of the London train stations where they're, they're pushing the old scooter with a foot. I'd encourage all that sort of stuff. Because a lot of stuff gets suppressed. They say, oh, that's dangerous, that's dangerous. You know what? Let people actually do stuff for themselves. I re I'd remove some of the controls police enforce on people um, because I think people do need to have a little bit of space to think and do things for themselves and realise something was stupid and it was their own fault. Um, so these sort of things I would actually say, yeah, fine. Um, because I would encourage more people to do more exercise, including myself. I have no problem with that. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, I do think when people, there was a shift on the sports centers. A lot of sports centers used to be pay as you go. When you go in, go in the gym, it's like, oh, I've got three pounds and the gym's three pounds. So I go to the gym today. 
And then you may not have enough money till Friday. But on Friday, you think, well, I've got another three pounds spare. I'll go to the gym. And that's what I was like when I was like 17. Um, but the point being is you've got to allow people to be able to afford things. What happens if you go to the gym today? Well, we'll give you an 18 month contract, encourage you to get in debt. And because you spend your money on your contract all the time, you may not even come in because you've got other things that you need to pay because we, you're charging you 40 pounds a month when you only actually want to come once a week. Um, that does not encourage health. That does not encourage financial um, stability. It encourages people to be locked into debt on contracts for long periods of time that may not be suiting. For example, the gym here. Um, I'm waiting till I've been to the Philippines and back. Why? Because I'm going to be gone a few weeks and I've got to pay three months up front. You can lock yourself into an 18 month contract or pay three months up front. And I'm thinking, well, if I'm away for a month out of three, I'll just wait. <laughs> you know, um, but the, the point being is there's a prime example. If it was just pay as you go, I'd be in there already. But they've actually encouraged me not to use it until I'm ready to do so, which is completely bizarre, especially in fitness. But a lot of the the fitness stuff recognizes the problems that people don't keep coming to gyms. But I would say in that case, a lot of the gyms are wrong. You're not encouraging people to come back. What are you doing wrong? Why is it not social? That needs looking at. And like I said, the NHS could be involved in a lot of the healthcare stuff before people have heart attacks, before people realize they're 23 stone and can't get out of bed in the morning because they're so fat and got problems with breathing and all this. Get them fit, get them working, get them motivated. And another thing that comes up on this, this sort of overlaps with the foreign policy and stuff, is I would actually reintroduce national service for people that do not find work within a fixed period of time or full time in education or at least doing something. Um, and I would say I'm not proactive in saying these people are for Afghanistan or anywhere else because I tell you now, that's not what they're for. It's not what they're for. I would call it a defense force. A defense force that probably would never see any action because it's not supposed to. It's supposed to teach people discipline. It's supposed to teach teach people self-awareness, self-worth, value themselves, how to make a bed, how to cook a meal, how to look after themselves, how to come out of something knowing that they've got some value and dignity. Because a lot of people do not get those opportunities these days. And this is why you end up with a cesspit of despair where some people will go out and stab somebody on a Friday night and don't care if they go to jail because life's crap anyway. You need to change all that. And being dragged around with 16, 20 other people, going through the same motions, the same pains, the same frustrations, getting pushed to a level of fitness you didn't even know existed within you, um, would fundamentally change a lot of that. As well as coming out with people that would be friends for life. And I do think those sort of things are important. And like I said, they're not supposed to be used as token gestures for warfare. That's not what it's for. It's a civil defense force. And in the sense of, it should never actually see active service anywhere beyond dealing with flooding um, or digging out snow or doing some medial tasks that are important for the community, but add self-worth. They're not litter pickers. They're not people that should be rolled out because G4S is incompetent in dealing with things like the Olympics. Um, I'm not mentioning Theresa May and her husband on that one. Um, her husband's linked with G4S. Uh, but it, anyway, on a, gone off on a completely different tangent, but that's how I deal with this. So that's my five questions. The video is way too long already, so I'll cut it off there. Thanks for watching.